Good afternoon. It's good to be back with everyone. I got to meet another Jewish believer who was here and uh, got to see the the expanse of how God is bringing more and more of our Jewish people to saving faith in our Messiah and lots of other folks as well because you make up the rest of the story. Without you, the story is not complete. So we're happy to see everyone aboard. So what we are going to do is, in your outline, introduction to biblical items, ritual items of biblical and modern Judaism. Once again, introduction to ritual items of biblical and modern Judaism. We have a slide a presentation that's going to illustrate part of that, and part of it is going to be live demonstration as well. Judaism in the Torah is God-given. Please understand that the nervousness that some Christians feel when we talk about Judaism is because, particularly in urban areas, your experience of what Jewish is has to do with the Jewish community in the neighborhood. So if you've had positive experiences with the Jewish community, perhaps you have a positive view of Judaism. And that's very, very quite possible. Sometimes people have negative experiences with individual Jewish people, because individual Jewish people are just like anyone else. Um, people commit crimes. Jewish people commit crimes. Uh, there are different types of crimes, OK? They're not mugging people in the street, but embezzlement is a different way of mugging people. <laughs> I'm not insinuating anything. Um, and so different groups of people have different proclivities. Please understand that your understanding of Judaism is an understanding of what you may have had an encounter with the modern Jewish community. That, again, can be very positive. There are wonderful role models in the Jewish community today that are um, helpful to everyone. There are self-help self authors. There are probably more Jews in entertainment than you realize. People are just kind of slipping under the radar who are Jewish. All kinds of people in popular music, in movies. Uh, you can't make Hollywood movies, you know. And there have been great movies and lousy movies made by Jewish directors. And so all of these things make up perhaps what you think of as being Jewish. But understand what we're now about to talk about is biblical Judaism. Judaism as God gave it in the scripture. If you considered yourself a true believer in the God of creation, 3,000 years ago, you were in a Jewish community. <clears throat> because most of the people outside were worshiping pagan idols. And so the center of the true worship of God was within the Jewish community. Once again, it doesn't make it an exclusive religion because God is not. His plan was that whosoever would believe are able to come. And now, when did that fully become realized? When Messiah Jesus made the way and everyone was invited to the table by faith. And so I'm glad you're all here. It's good for us, though, to recognize the type of Jewishness that God gave to Israel. So first in your notes, and hopefully first in our presentation, our PowerPoint, I'll occasionally call it an overhead. That's exposing my age. Um, because when I first started teaching in the early 90s, that's what we used. We used old acetate overheads. And so here you have illustrated, because I brought some items with me, but it, you know, they wouldn't be cool to bring an actual Torah scroll on the plane with me. I have access to one, but uh, this will need to do. And then I have other items that will live be demonstrated. God gave to Moshe Rabbeinu, to Moses, our teacher, as we call him in Hebrew, the, the books of the law. Now, of course, you can argue, well, look at the last uh, chapter of Deuteronomy. Moses died and is buried. Well, that was added by Joshua. 
That was common rabbinic tradition that Joshua added the final and last chapter of Deuteronomy, which talks about the death and, and burial of Moses at uh, Mount Nebo before, he, before uh, the people went into the land. The, the writing that God gave to Moses is inspired. Um, sometimes when I go to new places, people quiz me. They want to make sure I'm orthodox enough in doctrine. And one gentleman uh, who was here quizzed me, and he says, you know, is the account of creation, is it literal? Uh, or is, should creation account be taken as myth? No, I said it's literal. Uh, six 24-hour days, so I passed that test. Uh, and so in, this, in the same way, the Torah is the word of God. God impressed upon Moses how it would be written, but most importantly, God has superintended, he has overseen the results of it, so that what we hold in our hands as translations is the word of God. Are all translations perfect or the same? No, they aren't. Even in English, there are translations that vary in quality. I'm sure uh, a pastor could tell you, Pastor Marty could uh, have you understand the difference between word-for-word -word literal translations, like the New American Standard, very extremely accurate New um, English Bible, very accurate, versus thought-for-thought -thought translations. That's more like the NIV or the New Living Translation. There's a place for both, but ultimately you want to have access to the accuracy, and you do need a word-for-word -word translation. So the New American Standard is excellent for that. Uh, the New English Bible, there's a brand new Bible that just came out um, a few months ago called the Legacy Standard Bible by the profs at um, Master's Seminary. Uh, someone, I was speaking to someone here from, from, what's the name of the seminary? Master's Seminary in California, John MacArthur. Um, he has some professors on the staff there, very adept in the, the Hebrew and Greek. They tapped into other professors, and the Legacy Standard Bible is probably going to be the most accurate um, English translation available now. It will shock you, by the way, I'm serious about that, because it actually uses the Hebrew names of God. Um, it says Yahweh. And it says Yeshua. And these are this is from Master Seminary. So it's not some Hebrew roots movement trying to foist something on you. But I recommend you have that translation. You have a New American Standard. You have a New Living Translation. Of all of the paraphrases, by the way, the New Living Translation, not the Living Bible. I do not recommend that. But the New, new Living Translation is a thought-for-thought -thought paraphrase. There's a place for that. It's helpful to get an overview. However, what we're talking about here is the literal words of the Torah. And so we say here that the Torah scroll is the central ritual item of Judaism. Uh, and I now recognize I can't even see that screen without my driving glasses. <laughs> Another evidence of my, my uh, generation. And so this Torah scroll is a scroll written on animal parchment. A parchment is a term that is used um, sloppily, and, but strictly speaking, it refers to animal skins that are stretched, that are cut, stretched again, bleached, sanded, and thus form a material for writing. And so now that I can read it, the Torah scroll is the central ritual item of Judaism. It contains the five books of Moses, handwritten in Hebrew by quill pen on thin parchment sheets, hand sewn together. So if you're using like sheepskins, the, the sheepskins might be uh, maybe 30 inches by 24 inches. Once you square it out as a rectangular and you cut off the parts that just go off uh, the legs and area, and so you have a rectangle approximately 30 by 24. You sew that together edge to edge so that the scroll is approximately 24 inches high. 
approximately 88 skins need to be sewn together at the bare minimum. Some Torah scrolls have over 120, depending on the style of the writing. Every single jot and tittle in the Torah scroll is accounted for. That's why Jesus says, not one jot or tittle will pass away. The jot and tittle, just, I don't have an illustration here of it, but the jot is a bad English translation for the Hebrew letter yud. The yud is the smallest letter. It's a half letter at the top of the, uh, the and it's a consonant. It's the letter yud. Yahweh starts with yud. Yud, hey, vav, hey. Yehovah, Yehuda, all start with the letter yud. It's the smallest letter in the alphabet. Looks like a tiny little L. Jot and tittle. What's a tittle? Tittle is a little extension of a letter that differentiates, for instance, uh, excuse the Hebrew, a bait from a chaf. So you can have a bait, which is a B sound, because it has a tittle. If it doesn't have the tittle, it's a chaf, and it makes a chus sound. So Hebrew is very precise. In the Hebrew scroll, the letters handwritten in Hebrew by quill pen on thin parchment sheets. This is done by a trained rabbinic scribe, a sofer. Uh, that's the title of the, uh, the office. The person who does it is called a sofer. No, he doesn't have to be a rabbi, but rather he is a scribe. He is a sofer, he is a scribe. And trained scribes have, through thousands of years, been the men who would write the Torah scroll. In theory, in order to write a Torah scroll, you have to have another kosher Torah scroll, or what is called, excuse again the, the, the vocabulary, a tikkun. Tikkun is a large folio-sized book about this high that has the entire text of Torah, but also in one column it has no vowel points, the way that it's originally written in the Torah, and another with the vowel points. So, in other words, the Torah scrolls form the central item of Judaism. Whenever there is a fire at a Jewish synagogue, the screams and cries would go out in medieval ages, save the Torah scrolls, save the Torah scrolls. Um, about a year and a half ago, there was a whole disturbance in Israel, rioting between factions, and for the very first time, some Israeli Arabs Muslims were rioting in Israeli cities. Now, this is not in the West Bank. This is in Israel, in cities like Haifa, uh, Lud, and uh, Jaffa. And they actually set fire to a synagogue in Lud, which is near where the airport is. And you could see people rushing, people were taking video. Someone, some older woman just had the presence of mind to get out on her balcony call the police, and then start video recording because she saw that someone's trying to set fire to the synagogue. And her evidence was later used to catch the criminals. But you could hear shouts. People were saying in Hebrew, save the Torah scrolls. People ran into a smoking building that was slowly catching fire, rushed to where the Torah scrolls were, um, came out choking and coughing, but clutching the Torah scrolls, which are a, a scrolls approximately this high when you have the rollers. The animal skins are rolled onto wooden rollers. So you have typically, in one style, two rollers, then you have a cover over that. In every synagogue at the front is going to be a cabinet, maybe built into the wall or a rolling cabinet, <clears throat> that contain the Torah scrolls. And the Torah scrolls, again, are the five books of Moses. All five books on one single scroll. It is rolled around two wooden spools with a variety of, of case styles. <clears throat> on the right-hand side of your screen, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the silver cases there are more reminiscent of Sephardic scrolls. Uh, one of the Jewish brothers here, Eliot, I was speaking to him, and he has 
um, ancestry from the Jewish community of the island of Rhodes, uh, off of Greece and, and uh, Italy there. And uh, they would have used the silver Torah scrolls. The case would have been silver, but inside it's the same scrolls. Um, in the middle are the scrolls that I would be used to, and then on the left there are rabbis holding a Torah scroll up against uh, the western wall, the Kotel Hamaravi, there in Jerusalem. <clears throat> The Torah was the central item around which the first century church understood scripture. It was their daily reading. In the synagogue today, in a traditional synagogue, either orthodox or conservative, there is a yearly liturgical cycle of readings from the Torah scroll. Within a year, they will read and chant through the entire Torah scroll. And so when you hear of someone having a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, what that means is instead of the professional uh, cantor, the singer, chanting the Torah portion of the week, it's the young person, the 13-year-old boy or girl, who is tasked with reciting the portion in Hebrew that week. In reality, they very rarely sing the entire portion. They sing something that's called the maftir portion, which is the shortest portion of it, only four verses. But then they also have to chant, and this is all something my son did. Um, if you look uh, later on, I'll, I was about to say later on, I'll tell you about our prayer cards that has a picture of our son in front of a Torah ark. That's the ark of the congregation that I that I led as Messianic rabbi for 17 years. And our son, in his Messianic bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, our son's Messianic bar mitzvah, uh, had to be able to read Hebrew. So he happened to have a mom and dad who was able to teach him Hebrew. But we taught many of the other kids. We had around 18 Jewish kids, all believers, over those 17 years that came up through our bar and bat mitzvah program, boys and girls, some of them, the children of one parent who was not yet a believer, but participated and was agreeable to them having the bar bat mitzvah in our service. And we taught these kids how to read Hebrew. Hebrew is not a lang difficult language to learn how to read. Learning how to interpret it is another matter. Mechanically, you can read it. There's only 22 letters. It's not really difficult, especially when you start at nine years old, um, which is what we did typically. But the Torah scroll contains, and there's my son. Thank you for reminding me I have that picture. <clears throat> 2007, um, the hair was darker and the thicker. <clears throat> and there's our son, Jacob, reading from our congregational Torah scroll. Yes, he was actually reading <laughs> the Hebrew text. And so it's a staged picture, but that's what he was able to do. And so there to the right, you see another instance of Torah scrolls um, in a different place. So the Torah scroll, or Sefer Torah, meaning literally a Torah scroll, forms one of the most important items in the synagogue. It's a prized item. And it is the word of God. It is, uh, as Paul said about the Torah, <clears throat> the law is good, holy, and just. But it wasn't meant as law code for New Testament believers. The danger is of the Hebrew Roots movement is people become enamored of objects. It's easy for us as human beings to be impressed by the show. It's easy for us as human beings to be impressed by a light show and uh, smoke and mirrors and uh, people putting on a performance. And so there are people who are going to gravitate to churches that do that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, um, it's one way of doing things. But there's a danger in that, in that we make that the goal, that we seek that out and we gravitate to that instead of the pure teaching of the Word of God. People who gravitate toward objects have no anchor when tough times come. They go on to where is the next bigger show? And that sort of mindset doesn't evade you here in Las Vegas. <clears throat> it, people recognize the human condition and they play to the human condition. They exploit 
our frailty and they exploit our sin nature. And that's, that's on view around the world, not just here, it's, it's everywhere. So the Torah is important, but the Torah is not an object of veneration, even though it seems as though in the Jewish community they do. It's very carefully copied and every letter has to be precise. It's very valuable, it takes a man nine months to write a Torah scroll, and today if you would commission a new Torah scroll to be written, uh, you need to be willing to have about $40,000. This is why synagogues commission them. A synagogue will typically commission a Torah scroll. If a synagogue is growing, they may want more than one Torah scroll. So that's a little bit about that. Let's go on to the next item. In the slideshow, we have the idea of a kippah or a yarmulke. Uh, and I am tipping my hat about my local sports uh, loyalty. If you share that loyalty, protect me as I walk out the door. <clears throat> okay. This is what we used to call when we were kids, Elliot, Helene, and myself, we used to call this a yarmulke. And uh, that's the Yiddish phrase for it, but it is literally a kippah in Hebrew. Uh, for 17 years, as I led our Messianic congregation, this is how um, each Saturday morning I would open the scripture and do the liturgy and go through all of the things that we did on a Messianic congregation. This, where do you find this in the Bible? Trick question. You don't. It ain't there. It's not and here's, uh, just to get around you Bible scholars, it's not even in 1 Corinthians. <laughs> oh, I knew some of you were thinking that. I knew where you were going. No, it's not even in 1 Corinthians. This hat has a small and interesting history, just very quickly. Over the years, in many countries, Jews were persecuted. And rulers wanted a convenient way of identifying who was a Jew, who was not who you could punch with immunity, and who you couldn't. And so if you were a Jew, uh, you could be singled out for derision or persecution. So there needed to be some way of identifying it. So the yellow star that the Nazis forced Jewish people to wear during the Shoah, during the Holocaust, or the armband in some countries the Nazis forced upon them, was not a brand new concept. It was something that had been seen hundreds of years earlier. In many countries, they forced Jews to wear tri-corner hats. After a while, Jewish people were looking at this and saying, well, maybe it's not a badge of shame or a badge of dishonor. Maybe it can be a badge of honor. What oftentimes the rabbis have done through the years is taken something that has come about by necessity and added a new explanation to it. They've added a new way to explain it. And so if you would ask a typical Orthodox rabbi today, moderate orthodoxy, and you would say, why do you wear a kippah? Why do you wear it at all times? Even when you're going shopping, you're going this way, you're going that way. Why do you wear this? The typical response is this. It's a sign that I respect God. I don't appear in God's presence bareheaded. I'm not on his level. I'm, I'm not his homeboy, you know. I'm not, I'm not God's equal. I am subservient to God. I bow in his presence. And one way of showing that is by wearing the kippah to show that I'm subservient to him. That would be the explanation that this is why they wear a kippah. And again, you can oftentimes in lots of Jewish questions where there's a question to be settled, you will find dozens of Jewish commentators writing out answers to that question. And here's the kind of secret within the community that they don't often say. People will then pick and choose the answer that suits them best. There's an old phrase, two Jews, three opinions. <laughs> right? Because the, the main Jewish book of observance, how do you keep a Jewish life is a set of 30 volumes called the Talmud. The Talmud was written between the years 200 uh, AD and 550 AD. It is an ocean of books. 
comprised of two sections, Mishnah and Gemara, you can find rabbinic opinions because the Talmud is a set of dialogues between rabbis as they discuss their various opinions on how to do certain things within Judaism. So if you lean one way and you pick and choose certain aspects of Talmud that agree with you, you, you will be able to prove anything from Talmud. If you take the opposite view, you'll be able to pick and choose and find anything from Talmud that supports your view. By the way, this happens in evangelical circles as well. <laughs> People who believe in a pre-trib rapture have their favorite verses. People who believe in a post-trib rapture have their favorite verses. This is human nature. Oftentimes we tend to have proclivities where we're drawn to certain points of view, and then once we make up our mind, we go searching for Bible verses to substantiate what we already think. Now, true biblical exegesis, which is, you know, Pastor Marty would tell you, exegesis is first going to the Bible without a preconception about a doctrine. Doing your, your diligent study, deriving all the information, and then formulating your opinion. That's how it's supposed to be done. That's not always the way it is done. Same thing in Judaism. And so the Yarmulke of the Kippah is today worn by all Orthodox Jewish men. They wear this as a symbol that they are both Jewish and that they are trying to keep Jewish law. As you can see, there's all kinds of designs that come about. There's yarmulkes like this. There's, the color really doesn't matter much. It's actually the material that matters more. More um, observant folks will wear a black yarmulke, that's solid fabric. Uh, the knit kippah folks, this is knit are kind of a subset of the Orthodox. They're a little, little less formal, and you'll see them a lot in Israel, especially among the settlers. Uh, they will often be the knit kippah fact, uh, faction of things, but big black yarmulkes often mean the person is truly Orthodox. Um, you see all kinds of designs. Um, a number of years ago, my son wanted a, a mutant teenage mutant ninja turtle <laughs> yarmulke, because they, they have this fabric paint, they paint them on, and they sell them at crazy prices in the Jewish gift stores, of, of which there are a few in North Jersey, and my son knew where they all were. <clears throat> but you see, there's a display in Israel, uh, the, and we say here the kippah is not biblical in origin, but head coverings became standard by the year 1000 BC, 1000 AD. Why did I tell you that this has nothing to do with the first Corinthians passage? Um, and this is controversial, this is extra, you can uh, ignore that I said it. This is not what's being referred to in 1 Corinthians, where it says that, it, do you not know that is it a shame for a man to pray with his head covered? That's a valid thing. But if you actually do a deep dive into the Greek, the head covering of, that a man should be ashamed of is a gender-bending gender hiding sort of disguise. That's the head covering, I believe, based on my quizzing my friends who teach Greek in Bible colleges, that is the head covering referred to. Why is that my understanding? Because look at the context, the entire context of that Corinthians passage has to do with gender roles in the congregation. The fact that God places upon men the responsibility of qualified men, biblically qualified, spiritually led men, to take up the responsibility of being the spiritual elders in a congregation. So that would be not only your pastoral staff, but the other men here who serve as elders. The entire passage that prohibits the wearing of a gender-bending co head covering for men has to do with proper gender roles. A man should be carrying out his roles as God has assigned those roles and a woman the same way. A man should not attempt to obscure or fool about his gender, which it would be done by wearing a woman's sort of head covering so that if he is so somewhat veiled on the bottom, and then he wears a head covering that is decorative, that is feminine looking, it is an intentional attempt to deceive. 
I don't need to tell you that that is the way in so many corners of the world today with the transsexual movement and things of that ilk. Don't need to go any further. But that, I believe, is what's being referred to, not simple head covering. Now, out of respect for local church traditions, I'm not going to wear this tomorrow Sunday morning because it's just not the appropriate thing for here. But yesterday evening, when I spoke down at Beth Yeshua Congregation off of Flamingo Road there, I wore a head covering as I taught from the scripture and prayed because this is not the head covering spoken of in 1 Corinthians. Okay, enough of that. Let's go to the next item. Tzitzit and prayer shawl. In your notes are the scripture references for the prayer shawl and the tzitzit. Um, the talit, the word talit refers to the garment that this man is wearing on the right-hand side. That is a talit, particularly that is a talit gadol. Gadol means large. He is wearing a full vest that has the tzitzit, the fringes on it. The fellow on the left praying at the Kotal HaMaravi with his... Uh, by the way, the fellow on the left is an active duty serviceman. He, by by command, he's under command, he's in the army, he's on active duty, he got a few hours off to go pray at the Western Wall, but he is on active duty. He must keep his service weapon with him at all times. This is not for show, it's not for effect. This is because terrorism in the land of Israel can be real, but that should not dissuade you from going on the trip. Yeah, yeah the, the presence of guys like that who, see, everyone loves American tourists. American tourists bring folding things in their pocket. And everyone loves American tourists. And church groups generally, will, you'll never see any hint of dispute, uh, not a discouraging word all day. You will be treated well because people want your attention and they want your largesse. And so that's the way it is. So let's go to uh, in the scripture. Let's go, uh, would you turn with me in your Bible to Numbers chapter 15 verses uh, 37 and following, 35 and following. Numbers chapter 15 verses 37. And I'll need to switch glasses here so I can see the text of scripture. Numbers chapter 15. And let's look at that together where we see the command to put on tzitzit. Okay. And we're looking at Numbers chapter 15. And in that chapter, understand that this is given in the context of the theocracy. Everyone who is going to do this has signed on to be a member of, <coughs> excuse me, of this theocracy. So Numbers chapter 15, verse 37. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and tell them they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and they shall put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you played the harlot. So the presence of this garment, on each of the corners of your garment, you are to place a fringe on the corner of the garment. And this fellow is doing that. This fellow is wearing a garment that has on each of the corners a tassel, a fringe. The fellow on the left-hand side is also wearing a similar sort of garment, but his is a shawl. The shawl is worn when you're going to go to a specific item of prayer, a specific time of prayer. So here's an alert to our tech staff. We're going to be shifting camera position a little bit and stand up and demonstrate this. This is, as you see in the picture there, the talit katan. 
Both versions of the talit are similar in that they have on each of the four corners, they have this fringe. So each of the four corners will have this fringe and this is the reason for this garment. These four fringes, one on each of the four corners, are the only reason why this garment is worn. It is to obey this command there in Numbers chapter 15. Um, it's also repeated there uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the command to wear tzitzit. And the tzitzit is a word that refers to this series of knots and windings that form the fringes. The rabbis will tell you that if you count up all of the little loops, because all of these are little loops and then knots and loops and knots, supposedly if you count all of these up, they form a total of 613 when you total all, all four corners, 613 loops on all four totaled. And the 613 are to remind you of the 613 commandments that are found in Torah, so that when you wear this, you're reminded of your obligation. So typically what happens is on a Shabbat morning, you will see in certain neighborhoods Orthodox Jewish men walking to synagogue with this bag underneath their arm, this talit bag under their arm, and they're walking to shul, walking to synagogue, oftentimes with their sons. Interesting question, why are the women not there? Just to a long story short to explain it, in Orthodox traditional Judaism, women are bound by the negative commandments. Thou shalt not. They've got to obey all the thou shalt nots. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not uh, do this. Don't do, do, do that. But the positive commandments, you shall wear tzitzit on the corners of your garment, that's not their responsibility. They don't have to do that. Uh, they don't have to attend prayer services three times a day like Orthodox Jewish men are supposed to do. Uh, morning, afternoon, and evening. There are supposed to be three services a day that you attend. That's a positive commandment. Do this. They're not responsible. Now, oftentimes they will do those anyway. They will go to synagogue with their entire family, and they're there. But very often, they see their primary ministry as maintaining a kosher Jewish home, which is not as easy as it sounds because there are all kinds of rules and regulations about foods that can be mixed, foods that can't be mixed, meat and dairy, separation, all sorts of things. Uh, it's really a mind-boggling list of things that goes on. But this fellow on the left is wearing a talit katan, a small talit. So it's not a vest, but rather it is a shawl. What this does, though, is if you're going into a prayer service, this will allow you to say certain prayers which must be said with the prayer shawl onward. So they will first... Here is the neckband. The neckband has a, a gold sort of thread. And so they will first read the Hebrew prayer from the neckband. So this says in Hebrew, from right to left, <clears throat> Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kedushanu b'mitzvotav, vitzivanu lehit atef batzitzit. The translation is, uh, Baruch atah Adonai is, is blessed are you, O Lord, um, Eloheinu, who is our God, Melech HaOlam, who is King of the Universe, Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav, he has, he has sanctified us with his commandments and then commanded us to put on the tzitzit. That's the word for tzitzit there. And having said that, you then take the talit and all the different sorts of ways to do this, but you put it around your shoulders and you are now ready to pick up a siddur, a Jewish prayer book, and pray. In a traditional synagogue, if you walk into either a conservative, which is the, actually the middle group, it's not the orthodox group, it's a conservative synagogue or an orthodox synagogue. Basically, 
uh, we're going to talk about this in the next session, uh, you have here on your left, you have liberal reform Judaism. All the way in the right, you have um, orthodox uh, rabbinic Judaism. Here in the middle, you have conservative Judaism. So whether you're conservative or orthodox, on a Saturday morning, if you walk in, you're going to see at least 10 Jewish men or boys, and they will all be wearing talitot, like this one, and in their hands will be prayer books because the traditional service is a service of reciting psalms, reciting prayers. And if you would read the English translations of many of these prayers, you would say, oh, that's wonderful. Now, some of them you would recognize as being taken directly from the psalms. Some of them are, are literally psalms. You're reciting psalms. The Jewish community was very big on scripture memorization, particularly in the book of Psalms. Understand that a Torah scroll was an expensive item. If you were a poor family, you didn't have a, your own Bible in the house. There might have been a couple of community Torah scrolls. Some people who were like middle class were able to afford single books of the Bible. And the most popular typically were the book of Ruth, uh, book of Esther, uh, similar sorts of scrolls called the Megillot. Uh, and people would have those single scrolls. That's all they could afford. Sometimes they would have some of the sections of Psalms written down, uh, and they would memorize them as well. And so if you would read from that Siddur, most of which you, you would agree with most of what, you, what is written there, you would eagerly say that this is, yes, this is true. This also expresses my heart of devotion to God, and you could agree with it. But the problem is, oftentimes, that's the only prayer and communication. It's all pre-written. It is all there as far as um, it's someone else's thoughts. It's not prayer from the heart. It's not spontaneous prayer. And so, but this is how they would, would pray. Now, here's an interesting turn of things. People talk about, um, in the ministry of Jesus, that you know, oftentimes Jesus, in his public ministry, uh, disdained a lot of the things that the, the scribes and Pharisees were, were pushing, the things that they were into. So turn with me over to, to Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, um, I'm sorry, now Matthew, yes, Matthew 23, verse 5. Matthew 23, verse 5. Here, here is a juxtaposition of two different things that we see about the talit, the prayer shawl, in the ministry of Messiah Jesus. Uh, that is really uh, an amazing sort of thing to see. And you know something? I'm going to ask you to backtrack with me. Would you go please to, to Matthew 9 first? Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verse 20. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 is where we need to go first. In Matthew 9, verse 20, here's the famous story of a woman who had been suffering from a medical condition for many years. And this condition actually rendered her ritually unclean. She really was not supposed to go out in mixed society. She was supposed to keep to the edges of the town so that no one would go near her. She was ritually unclean, and she was not welcome in polite society. She couldn't attend gatherings. She had this, this medical hemorrhaging condition for 12 years, verse 20 says. A woman who had been suffering from hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him, and she touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I shall get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, you take courage. Your faith has made you well. What's that all about? This is a woman who was spurned by society. A woman who was not welcomed by society. And here's this famous rabbi, up-and-coming rabbi. Everyone was talking about him. He's coming through town. He's going to give a drash. He's going to, he's going to give a speech. He's going to give a Torah teaching. 
Everyone wants to go see him. He's, he's probably going to walk along this path. This woman positions herself, anticipating that was the path he's going to walk by. And his entourage, the disciples are there. This may be a group of 20, 30 people. People saying, there he is, there he is. He's going to go to, the, to that building. And this woman had the chutzpah, as we say in Hebrew. And she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment. What did she touch? He was wearing a garment like the one on the right that had fringes. Why? Because the Torah commands it. Jesus was a Torah-keeping Jew of his day. Why? As the scripture says, he was born under the law to free those who are under the law. <laughs> he was still, he voluntarily subjected himself to all of the prescriptions of the law. He did not exempt himself from anything which he himself commanded. He is the author of our faith. He is the author of scripture as well. He commanded those things. And so when he comes to earth, he takes upon himself all of those responsibilities. He could have come to earth in, as any race in theory. People talk about it, of course, they, they don't realize that scripture says he's going to come as a Jew. But by coming as a Jew, he voluntarily places himself under all of the Mosaic law rules and regulations. One of which was if you're wearing a garment that has four corners, you're going to have to have fringes on it. He wore these fringes. This woman lets us know that he did. But why is she doing this? In that day, there was a superstition that said if you reach out and touch the fringes of a truly holy rabbi, a pure man, and reach out and, and touch the fringes of his tzitzit, you shall be healed. It's a silly, foolish superstition. It's not true. She heard it, and she said, well, maybe it is true. Well, all these highfalutin people, all these you know, holy guys are saying that this is true. Maybe it is. So she went about doing that. But what was important? She was thinking, this is the holy man of God. This is a man who is pure. This is a man who is sinless. So it wasn't the silly act. It was her thought that preceded the act where she had come to, to place her faith in this person. So much so, what was the proof of that? That she knew that as soon as she reached out to touch the hem of his garment, sticks might have come on her. People might have taken sticks and beat her away, saying, Get, you know you're not supposed to touch him. You know, how dare you be in, in this religious company? So Jesus knew that. What's the first word out of Jesus' mouth? He says, daughter, you're with me. She's mine. That's what Jesus said to this woman who was spurned by everyone else. No one will touch her. No one will go near this woman. But Jesus says, daughter. In other words, he's saying to everyone around, my daughter, she's mine. You can't, she's a family member. Touch me? Sure, she's going to touch me. So he was wearing this garment. So that much is clear from the, the Matthew chapter 9 portion. So now turn to Matthew 23. We know he's wearing a garment like this. And in Matthew 23, we see the, the other side of this. Matthew 23, verse 1 and 2. Jesus spoke to the crowds and said, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. There's a lot of humor there. Not that they were placed in the chair of Moses. They've seated themselves in the chair of Moses. That's what they did. It was a self-appointment. Okay? It was a self-appointment. They've seated themselves in the chair of Moses. And so in, this is almost jocular at this point. So he says of them, because there's a running dispute. He says of them, Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and they do not do them. For they tie up heavy burdens and lay them upon men's shoulders, 
but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. They do all of their deeds to be noticed by men. How? They do all of their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and they lengthen the tassels of their garments. They lengthen the tassels of their garments. In other words, if you were wearing that vest on the right-hand side, all you would need to do in order to fulfill the command was to have a, a, a fringe that was maybe two inches long. That would fulfill the commandment. That's all you needed. And in the earliest years, that's what people did. But what the Pharisees did, they wanted to show off their religious garments. They wanted to impress everyone with their religiosity. So instead of having a two-inch seat, they go and have a long fringe like this. So when these guys are walking down the street, they're shashaying down the street like this, and everyone sees them coming because the fringes are flopping in the wind, and it's, it's a very dramatic show. And so what did Messiah Yeshua say about this? They do all of their deeds to be noticed by men, for they lengthen the tassels of their garments. Literally, it's these four fringes. It's not just the hem. Some of your translations say she reached out to touch the hem of his garment. The word there is not hem. It's a separate Greek word for hem. It says literally the fringe. It says the tassel of the garment, because Jesus was wearing, in accordance with Mosaic law, this sort of tassel. And so uh, that's one of the things he said that, she, that uh, the Pharisees were doing. The other thing he said is that they broaden the straps of their phylacteries. This is one of those verses in the New Testament that people kind of skip over. What do you mean they broaden the straps of their phylacteries? What are phylacteries even? Okay, so let me first uh, make sure I'm still able to talk. Phylacteries are small leather boxes that are commanded in the scripture. You see the, in your notes there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18, Exodus 13. Uh, verse 9, Exodus 13, verse 16. Those are the passages that command the phylacteries. In Greek, the word is phylacteries. None of us Jewish kids ever use the term phylacteries. Helene, do you know what this is? Tefillin, exactly. She's exactly correct. These are tefillin. This is what they're called in the Jewish community. There are two um, a, a portions of this. So would you look at those portions with me? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, which is where they are commanded. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8. And in that most famous of passages in the Jewish Bible, the most famous verse, by the way, is Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The most famous verse in the Hebrew Bible, verse 4, in Hebrew sounds like this. It says, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then it goes on to say, and you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your mind, uh, with all that is within you. Uh, these words which I am commanding you this day shall be upon your heart, verse 6. You shall teach them diligently to your children, you shall talk of them when you walk uh, by the way in your house, when you walk uh, along, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Verse 8 is our center verse there. And you shall bind them, these words, you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets or as a symbol upon your forehead. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets or a symbol on your forehead. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. So what they do is they will take tiny little scrolls, very, very small scrolls, 
and I've got this one open. This is a very thick piece of top leather, very thick cowhide, and it is stretched and it's formed, but it's very thick, it's several layers deep. And then here there is a hinge, and I can't open this all the way, but inside here, actually I can, inside here there is a further little box, and that box contains the tefillin. Inside this little portion right here, there is a small scroll that is rolled up that's about 20 inches long by around an inch and a half high. This is a kosher tefillin scroll. A scribe wrote this on a piece of animal skin. That's what that is. It's been very finely sanded. It's been sanitized. It's been cured, and it's rolled up. And then they take a quill pen with vegetable ink, homemade vegetable ink with roots and oils and charcoal all ground up, and they write out the words that we just read. They write out the words in Hebrew, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall um, write these words on the doorpost of your house, upon your gates. All these things you shall do, and then they shall place them as a symbol on your arm and on your forehead. And so what they shall do is take the straps, and one of these is then placed on the four, which one is it? Yep. This one is placed on the arm. They're, they're slightly different. This one is placed on the arm, on the bare arm, and the leather strap would go through this. And these are old and kind of rickety, so it's kind of falling apart here. But the leather strap goes through that. Then this is then bound to the arm and it's placed and fastened on the arm, in essence, and it is held there, and it is bound there. You use your right hand to fasten it, and it, it's, you wrap the strap around your arm, and I'll just detach that for the moment, several places where you, you're winding this over and over around your arm, and there are four or five windings, something like this, and then at the end, it's wrapped around the hand, but this goes around the arm. You can see that this is a very thin piece of suede. Uh, it's relatively narrow. If you would go into an orthodox religious article store to buy one of these, you would not see a simple tefillin strap like this. What did Jesus say about the tefillin? He said, of the Pharisees, for they broaden the straps of their phylacteries. Instead of having old suede, dull brown straps, they would use thick, full hide leather straps that were about an inch wide. They would polish them with black, shiny, glossy polish to a high sheen. And they would wrap them around the arm and then another one would go on the head. So this one is the one that is for the head, Shalyad, and this one would go on the forehead like that. And once again, as strange as it might sound to you, this is something that Jesus would have had several days a week, or maybe every day, it's uh, up in the air, and would have prayed with the scrolls inside this leather box, with one around his arm, and one on the forehead with the straps hanging down. Jesus did that. He came to redeem us from those who are under the law. So it's not as though these things were somehow uh, something that were foreign to him. They are certainly not foreign at all, but what he does here in the Matthew 23 passage is he calls out the people who are making this a religious show. So once again to the Matthew 23 passage, he was getting on the scribes and Pharisees. 
He's saying, look, you've taken the things of God and you've made a religious show of it. The things that are holy and, and righteous, you're making like it's showtime. And, and that's what they're doing here. Matthew 23, verse 5, they do all of their deeds to be noticed by men for they broaden the straps of their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. So once again, you need to be able to strike the balance. Yes, Jesus would have been wearing the tzitzit. He would have been wearing uh, the, the tefillin here. But he said, you do this as a private practice of devotion. You don't do this as a religious show. And, you know, not to get uh, editorializing here, I think there's a lesson for us today even in the modern church. What is the heart motivation when we come to even a worship service, with the way we arrange our worship services. Are they shows or are they really services of the heart where we're, we're truly in, in a sense of worship of the one true God? So these are the to fill in the leather boxes. Uh, these uh, run very expensive. These are, this is an old pair, and no rabbi would say that this is now certifiably and you can use them. The scrolls may be kosher and orthodox, uh, but they would say, oh, you need to make new straps. The straps have to be broader. The straps have to be wider. And that goes right back to the problem there. Number five in your outline. By the way, you'll notice there's no number three, but there are two number fours. <laughs> Don't do outlines at midnight. Okay? Number five is the shofar. And the shofar, of course, is something that we, we demonstrated a bit regarding the ram's horn, regarding the holiday of uh, the Feast of Trumpets. The ram's horn, as you see there, it's usually made from sheep uh, or antelope in more recent times. It is commanded in Scripture. It is there by design. And we covered this a lot in our earlier session, so I'm not going to dwell on this. But again, this was something that was made uh, very simply of, of natural uh, materials. Here's an interesting sort of sidelight. Whenever you see the term silver trumpets, don't think, think of some Hollywood B-movie with long trumpets and you know, flags hanging down. It was literally a shofar in which they had taken soft silver that was very like near pure. When you have very pure silver, it's very malleable. So you can take a thin sheet of silver, you can burnish it onto a shofar, and you can actually cover it and have a silver shofar. So whenever you see the phrase silver trumpet in the Bible, that is literally what is being spoken of. It's the, the actual shofar with silver on top of it. Okay, the next item in your list there is that of the mezuzah. And you see there in the illustration, in the PowerPoint, uh, various types of cases of the mezuzah. And so there you see on the left-hand side that we say their cases can be metal, wood, ceramic, or plastic, starting at maybe four inches long. They can go as long as six or seven inches. But that are, those are the various cases. At the top are some small metal cases. Those are maybe four inches. On the bottom are some larger wooden cases that the more orthodox tend to prefer. On the right-hand side is the actual scroll. That scroll is going to be handwritten like a little Torah scroll, and it will be about four inches square. So that would be the scroll that is rolled up and placed in the mezuzah casing. So here is the mezuzah uh, that can illustrate this. And every mezuzah has on one uh, end of it the letter sheen, the Hebrew letter sheen. And that is uh, uh, simply an abbreviation for the Hebrew word Shaddai, which means uh, the Almighty God. El Shaddai was a popular Hebrew song, uh, a popular evangelical song a number of years ago, where they, they took badly transliterated Hebrew and brought that into a, a song. But people were singing it. Uh, and Israelis were saying, what in the world are they trying to sing? 
it was garbled, but uh, it was effective in drawing attention to the fact that he is El Shaddai. Shaddai, they got right. He is almighty. And that sheen, that letter sheen, the sheen, sh sound, is that sound. Every mezuzah case is simply uh, a, a material case. It could be wood, plastic, ceramic, glass, metal, anything. But what is important is in the back of the case, the back is hollowed out. And in that hollowed out back is a mezuzah scroll. And in that mezuzah scroll would be the thing that you see there on the right-hand side would be the small scroll. Again, it would be a handwritten, get this right side up, Shema Yisrael is right there, a small handwritten scroll that would be written with a quill pen using, once again, homemade vegetable ink, and the mezuzah scroll would be written out, and the words there would be taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and a small portion in Numbers. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, And you shall write these words, which I command you this day, upon your gates and upon your doorposts. And you shall think of them, you shall talk about them. When you rise up, when you lie down, when you're walking by the way, you shall talk to your children of them. And so that little portion is placed in the hollowed out back of the mezuzah case. It's then sealed, glued down. This happens to have two little screw holes there. This is then fastened to a doorway. Do we have another slide? Do I, did I put up another slide of the mezuzah? Uh, next slide there in the PowerPoint. Anything? No, okay, so go back to the mezuzah there. So you would place this mezuzah, if I'm walking into my house, I'm walking from outside, I'm walking into my house, here's the doorway of my house. The mezuzah is always on the right-hand doorpost at eye level. Again, on the right-hand doorpost at eye level. So that when you go in, you're supposed to touch the mezuzah. People will sometimes then kiss their hand, there's all sorts of rituals that go on, but the mezuzah is supposed to be eye level. And this is on, should be on every Jewish home anywhere in the world. When we lived in Jerusalem, we saw people actually would gouge out in their stone lintel of the doorway, the, 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 in fact, in the vertical, uh, the edge there, the door jam, they'd have thick stone door jams, and they'd actually scratch out with an awl the words, Hero Israel, in, in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. But then they would also place the mezuzah. Very interesting side note, this connects with Passover. The place where you were supposed to put the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorway, you're supposed to take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is the blood of the Passover lamb, and place it on the doorpost of your house. In Hebrew, it's the word mezuzot. In other words, the part of the doorframe that is at eye level is the mezuzot. But in this case, it's both. It's both sides. It's a feminine plural word. So you're supposed to place the blood on both sides. So that meant you were to take the bunch of hyssop, dip it in the basin of the doorway, which is in the ground, take that blood, strike once the lintel of the door, does not say paint it on, doesn't say cover it. It says strike it once, then it says strike one doorpost, then it says strike the other doorpost. So you've gone from the blood of the lamb in the basin on the ground, that's what the text says, to the lintel, to one doorpost, to the other doorpost. What have you done? You have made the symbol of a cross using the blood of a Passover lamb, and the year is 1300 BC. God is saying to my own Jewish people that if you want to be passed over in judgment, the one method is to 
put the blood of the Passover lamb on your doorway. And so finally, the last item before we close out this session is once again the matzah tosh, but I kind of spilled the beans on that and spilled some matzah as well um, as we demonstrated the matzah tosh, three matzahs, and we asked the rabbi, Rabbi, why are we the three matzahs? Why is it that we take the middle sheet out, its body is broken, wrapped in a white cotton shroud, and buried until the third cup? The rabbi say, we don't know and neither do you. <laughs> so don't give it any Christian spin. Well, that's what they say. But you have three matzahs, the middle one is taken out, wrapped in a white cotton shroud, buried until the third. What we have here is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because God the Son, the middle one, was taken out, left his place in heaven, came down to earth only to have his body broken, wrapped in a white cotton shroud, and buried until when? Until the third day. And it's the third cup when the broken body comes up. Amazing things to see by just understanding these basics of the Jewish roots.